Hello and welcome to AXA Coral Live and welcome to the Kamabi Research Station. My name's Jamie from Encounter EDU and I'll be working with you through this live investigation, the incredible We're at a field research station, Kamabi, <coughs> and it's wonderful to be here. There's scientists from so many different countries studying so many different aspects of the coral habitat, from moray eels to the deeper reef to sponges to the dissolved organic matter, that's the sort of sugars um, in the seawater, and a host of different things. Now, a field research station is somewhere that visiting scientists can come to stay. Uh, they maybe come here for a project for a couple of weeks or potentially for even longer, for a number of months. And some people turned up uh, years ago and have been here for about 10 years. Uh, and what it does is support for those scientists is it has a mix of laboratory facilities, so there's uh, dry labs and wet labs, and those are places that the scientists can analyze their samples, can run experiments, can do some backup work there. But what's growing on the piles of the jetty here, brain corals, a yeah, few star corals that's further out as well. And you might even see some Christmas tree worms, one of my favorites, more octopus, schools of fish, especially um, the smaller ones such as the blue-headed wrasse, and maybe the odd ray go past as well. So a really, really special place that mixes up laboratory-based science, analysis, processing of samples, as well as getting out into the field, either running experiments on the reef or collecting samples. What we're doing today is we're doing a live investigation and we're looking at coral. What is it? Is it animal, vegetable or mineral? And so we'll be looking at a few things. First of all, we'll be developing our knowledge about what coral is. Second, we will be using some fun ways of working scientifically to make a model. And in this case, we're going to be using sweeties and fruit and that kind of thing to make a model of a coral anatomy. And third, we'll be looking at how we can take that knowledge and think about how that makes us more aware of the environments around the world and perhaps our role in sustaining them. So that's our little session today. And it's great to have schools on board, and we're just going to check in to see who we've got. So we have schools from Lithuania, the USA, the UK, uh, Colombia, Canada, and Poland with us. And we've got a few shout outs for you guys. We've got Mrs. Bray, Miss Long, and Miss Markham's first grade students at Flatwoods Elementary School in Lee County, Virginia. A big hello to all the first graders there. Hi! Uh, we have Mr. Um, Diaz's class, uh, INEM, Santiago Perez. Hi there to you and all your students. Uh, we have a big hello to all the students at David Leader Middle School in Canada and to the students also at Lyman Elementary in the USA. And last but not least, um, to the Vilnius uh, Seminos Gymnasium in Lithuania. Hi to all the students there, really wonderful to have you with us. And the breakdown 
of this session is really twofold. We're going to do a little investigation, the incredible edible polyp shortly. And then we'll have time for pre-submitted questions and then live questions. So questions submitted via the live Q&A on YouTube. There are other ways to be in touch and do be in contact with the team um, back in London. But before we start our live investigation, there are a couple of little anagrams for you guys and a couple of important words that will be coming to during the incredible edible polyp activity. So we're gonna give those over to you now and see how you get on. So I wonder how you got on. Two really great words, coral, and then the second one I find really tricky, well I found really tricky when I had a look at it um, earlier, tentacles. So uh, what we, we're gonna move on to the live activity stage and what you need is just a few uh, bits of sweetie and fruit. Now, I've got a rather mushy banana, it's been in the heat for probably too long. Uh, or you can have a uh, marshmallow um, and we're going to show you how to cut that up in a bit uh, some biscuits uh, so nice thin biscuits like a rich tea um, we've got those here we've got some sugary laces which are always very very nice um, so we're going to be using some of those and then the last two pieces We've got some sugar sprinkles, and those are gonna come in really, really important later. And um, not to forget, we have some wonderful jam here, and I seem to have found myself with peach marmalade. Uh, any jam will do, um, as long as it doesn't have too many bits in it, that makes it a bit harder. Now, the other thing you'll need today is a knife. You do not need a sharp knife like this. I just find it a little bit easier. Um, when I'm here, um, just an ordinary kitchen knife and a pair of scissors can be useful and a toothpick. So, everybody having a chance to get all their kit ready and then when I'm just going to make sure you've got that done, you can do this live with me or you can choose to just watch and then you can complete this activity in your own time. I'm just going to cut my banana, take the end bit off. Hopefully your, your banana is not as squidgy as mine. It hasn't been in the tropical sun for too long. I am trying to sit in as much shade as possible, uh, as you may have realised. Um, it is just on one o'clock in the afternoon in the tropics. So what we want, first of all, and the realization that the coral is an animal, okay? So it's related to a jellyfish, yeah, floating through the water with tentacles, related to a sea anemone, which is basically a bit like a jellyfish, smushed to the bottom of the sea. Related to those two, and it has this body. So for this, you can either use a section of banana or you can use a marshmallow. Jumbo marshmallows, of course, being the best. I'm gonna start off by giving my coral polyp a mouth uh, so it can feed. This was a toothpick there. I'm 
And then remember what we said. We said that it mm, doesn't float through the ocean, but is stuck to the bottom of the ocean. So to represent the bottom of the ocean or the substrate, we have our biscuit. Now, corals can't just settle anywhere. They couldn't settle on this beach, for instance. They need a rocky, hard, rocky substrate or, or, or sea floor to settle on. So what we're going to do next is we're going to stick our coral polyp to our sea floor or rocky substrate. And the way we're going to do that, and we're just going to put it on the plate in a bit, is to use a bit of jam to stick it on. So I'm just going to do that now. Open my pot of jam. And just take a little bit out, smush it onto my biscuit, technical word there. And there we go, attach my coral polyp to the sea floor. So what I have here, I've got my coral polyp with a mouth attached to the sea floor. Now we're going to come back to the... Uh, we're going to come back to the words that we had, so tentacles. So we've got a mouth, we haven't really got any way of getting food. So like the sea anemone, like the jellyfish, we're going to get tentacles on here. And it's, that's how the coral polyp catches food in the ocean. So the way that we're going to do that, I'm going to put it back down on the plate. And I'm going to make six small holes around the outside and six is the number of tentacles that most coral polyps have. I'm going to take my sugar laces and I'm going to cut sections off there so I'm going to cut six sections. Oops all a bit slippery in this hot sun and lay them down on my plate one two three four five and six there we go and we're just going to get these and lean over a bit more try it's a bit fiddly this bit so if you if you do well that's fantastic and I'm going to try and get there we go I've got one tentacle in there probably helps that my banana is melting in the sun I didn't know bananas could melt I do now I've got the second one going in a bit more there we go third one looks a bit fiddly Put that in maybe I need to use my toothpick toothpicks can always be useful just to Shove it in a little bit more. Oh. There we go. That's two. And then it's three. And here's the fourth one. Might make this hole a little bit better. There we go. Raspberry, cherry, and strawberry jam being used. Well, I hope it's going to taste nice. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous, but I will have to make do with my peach marmalade. So, just putting my last, nearly my last tentacle in. And the coral polyp uses these tentacles to catch small animals that drift on the ocean current. And we give those the term plankton. There we go. A little bit droopy, but there we have my coral polyp with the six tentacles coming off it. Now, corals are amazing animals because they grow and develop these wonderful reefs around the world. And Charles Darwin asked this question when he first saw this diversity of life and this abundance of life in the ocean. I went, oh, well, how can this possibly be in these wonderful clear waters? 
Now, if you have clear water, it means there aren't that many of the tiny little animals sort of floating around, relatively caught by coral polyps. And the discovery was that, in fact, the way that coral polyps get most of their energy is from having algae, plant-like living things, inside their tissue. So that's a bit like having the vegetables inside you and you get the sugars as they receive energy by sunlight and photosynthesis. So what we're going to do next to represent those wonderful algae inside the tissue that gives the coral polyp most of its energy is we're going to sprinkle some of these tiny green sugar sprinkles on top and that represents our algae. Now one of the interesting things I find, and I'm just going to get some M&Ms here to talk to you a little bit more about the coral. So, I've got a few different colours of M&M, and the coral polyp, like a jellyfish, is pretty colourless. And it gets its colour from the different type of algae in its tissue. So, it might be orange. Am I allowed to eat these? Oh. It's very melted. It might be red, if you get red coral. This is the best. You want one? Which colour would you like, Ali? Green. green. There you go. It could be green coral. It could be yellow. Yellow coral. Brown. Get some brown corals around. If you see blue on a coral, it's probably not the algae giving this colour. But some corals can create a sunblock protein. It's sort a of bluey lilac colour. So that's what you get there. Too much chocolate for one day. So what we have here, I've used green sprinkles, but you can have a range of different colors to represent the different colors of algae um, that are in the coral. Now, the problem here is that the coral could be attacked by different predators. There's a tiny wee animal about the size of a pinhead, just a few millimetres across. And so what it does is it takes a mineral from the water, uh, limestone, chalk, calcium carbonate, and it starts to build a structure to protect itself. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to use another biscuit, um, and we are going to break this off, and we're going to stick it around the coral. So I'm just going to do that now down here. So break the biscuit up. Sorry, just give me a minute to sort a couple of things. And we're going to use a little bit of jam to stick these sections here. And this is called the Coralite. It's a calcium carbonate structure. It's like a little cup. And as the coral grows, it makes this cup and then it gets a bit bigger and the coral polyp divides into two, becomes two, two polyps and each of them make a cup and divides and divides and divides and divides until it makes a wonderful coral colony. And those coral colonies are the fantastic shapes you see make up the reef. And last but not least, coming here, oops, a little bit more jam out, onto the last bit here, not too much jam, and put it on the side. So here we are, our incredible edible polyp. So we have the body made out of banana, so that's the animal. We have the tentacles that it uses, much like a jellyfish or sea anemone, traps plankton, small animals uh, in, on the water currents. But that's only between 10 and 30% of its food. So to supercharge itself 
and to get all that amazing energy to build the incredible roof we see here in Curacao and around the world, it has a relationship with this algae called Suxanthelli, and that gives it between 70 and 90% of its energy. Then using that extra energy to build the coralite, the calcium carbonate structure that makes up the three-dimensional living space that is the reef. So uh, hopefully you've got on really well. I'm just gonna have a little bite here. I think I deserve that after that work. Oh. 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 Wow. <laughs> so hopefully your coral polyps turned up as tasty as mine. What we're going to do, I've got a couple of little questions for you just before we start to answer yours. So they can come up, a couple of predictions to look at, and then also you can spend this time getting your questions ready via the live chat, and we'll be back with you for the Q&A section of this session in just a moment. Hi, I wonder how you got on. So they're not the easiest questions. So the first question asks me to think about the amount of the ocean covered by the reef. And I wonder how many of you got that right. It's a tiny 0.1%. And what I found amazing is that although the amount of ocean covered by reef is so small, the amount of life supported by the reef is huge. So 25% of all marine species are supported by the coral habitat. Then looking more at a sort of a human way of examining the value of the reef, I wonder how many of you got that one right? Yeah, an amazing $375 billion. And it's odd to think that just one ecosystem can be that valuable. But there are several ways in which we get goods, things, or services from the reef. It helps to protect cities, towns, and villages near the coast by acting as a natural barrier to storms. It's somewhere where people can go fishing, either for their livelihood or to surf. It's also crucial for the tourism industry, on which many small islands are dependent, as well as being the potential for a huge amount of medicines to be found. So both chemicals in corals and chemicals in sponges could yield really important and crucial medicines for the future of curing things like cancer. 
So that's where the value of the reef comes from to make up that incredible $375 billion number. What I'm going to do now is just check in to see the questions that are coming through. And we've got some um, great questions uh, from Cambridgeshire in the UK. From Sarah, we've got how old the corals? Sarah, that's a great question. So corals have been around for about 500, just over 500 million years. But the kind of corals that we find at the moment that make up the reef are bit sort of you know sooner than that probably from between sort of 150 220 million years ago but you know those huge structures that we think about as being iconic reefs so the Great Barrier Reef really came into existence about 20,000 years ago and the oldest coral we know of just over 4,000 years old that's not a reef coral that we find here that's a deep sea black coral so there's a lot of old corals around Next question is from Marcus. Marcus um, was given a coral necklace on holiday. Someone told me it was bad. So Marcus, it's a really great question. So while there are bits of coral lying around and in some places you can find coral that is years and centuries and millennia old, there is a temptation by buying jewellery or other holiday gifts made from coral that somebody might have gone off onto the reef and picked coral and coral is protected and so buying coral jewellery has the potential to make people go and pick coral as a gift instead of preserving it where it is so the best coral gift you can do is by working and sort of almost buying a coral reef, helping a conservation organization sustain a coral reef for the future. Um, Eve would like to know how many different types of coral are there? Well, there's different types of coral. We've got sort of, you know, whip corals and um, soft corals, but really when we talk about the hard corals that make up the tropical reef, what we're talking about is about a thousand species in total and you'll get more diversity, more different kinds in the Indo-Pacific and in areas like the Great Barrier Reef. In the Caribbean, there is less diversity. There are fewer different species. And on an island like Curaçao, we have about 70 different species of coral. Um, Eleanor uh, would like to know what corals are related to. We covered that a little bit. They're in a group of animals called Nidaria and they're related to jellyfish and sea anemones. And if you can reach back to Finding Nemo and the importance of the sea anemone there. So that's the kind of animal they're related to. And really it's those animals with tentacles and stinging cells. And got these little um, harpoon-like stinging cells in their tentacles called the matocysts. Uh, and that's how they get onto their, onto their prey. Um, Jay, great question, Jay. I'm um, asking, is there rubbish in the Caribbean? Yes, there is rubbish. I mean, and, and like many countries around the world, uh, rubbish management and waste management and making sure it doesn't get into the environment is a really important way of thinking about and acting upon environmental concerns. So making sure that plastic doesn't get into the ocean, especially because the plastic is one of those substances and one of those materials it takes such a long time to break down in the environment. So, great to have the live questions coming through. And sorry, the, the sun is reflecting massively off my screen here. Um, but through, crikey, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna duck down just so I can read these things. Um, Flatwood Elementary, what are the daily activities of a marine biologist uh, really great question. It's so diverse. I mean, when you come to a field station, there are lots of different um, activities you might be doing. I can see some of the teams are studying sponges. They're just gearing up at the moment, um, maybe to go and look at an experiment they've set up and, and to carry on doing that. It may be a case of having those samples and working it on the lab. A lot of the time, the, the field work is often a sort of short, very glamorous part of it. And a lot of the time is working that up in the lab analyzing your data 
and then publishing. And publishing scientific papers is a way that scientists share what they've done, both within the science community and more widely. So often you'll see some science news in a newspaper or on a TV news program, and that will be because scientists will have come potentially somewhere like here, studied, done experiments, got their data, got their samples, analyzed it more, written it up, and then published that, and then the news can report on it. No typical day, but we'll see um, Nick and Amber, I think, head off, who are doing some research on sponges. They're just behind us, so I think when they get a bit further out, we'll be able to spot them. Um, what is it like under the ocean? Again, from Flatwoods Elementary, it's another world. The closest I have been able to describe it, to compare it to, is the Disney cartoon Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, when Snow White is in a forest and Disney are creating all these like, butterflies and birds and there's so much colour and abundance um, and diversity of life and, it, and that's the coral reef it's just like another world just to be in the ocean in general is to have a sense of being in a three dimensional environment and potentially if you're scuba diving flying through that so there's an up down it's not just like being on, on land where you're on this 2D plane but you can actually explore this three dimensional world uh, and so it's very special um, this kind of environment uh, why are there sharks in the water? Um, I think probably because if they were on land, they'd be in a bit of trouble. <laughs> but sharks are one of the oldest uh, fish. They've been around, I think, for about 400 million years. And they play an incredibly important role in the environment as the apex predator, at the top of the food chain. And so they keep the other um, predators in check and create balance um, across the the uh, here across the coral food web. There's a really interesting paper that came out on, um, I can't remember which institute in Australia, that basically had this really strong link between if there are lots of sharks and a healthy coral reef. So sharks are incredibly important uh, for coral health. Now if there's another follow-up question, please put it on the live chat. It may not be the question uh, or the answer uh, that you're looking for. Um, Caroline, hi Caroline, how are you? Um, from Atlanta, Georgia, great to have you with us. Um, are there sharks next to the reef? Well, very sadly, there aren't sharks around here at the moment at all. Um, there's been a lot of overfishing of sharks, and I think it's estimated between about 100 and 150 million sharks are caught each year. Um, so they're in the real trouble. And they've got a really bad reputation. So Steven Spielberg, a film director, many years ago made a film called Jaws. And for a lot of people, that has changed their perception of sharks, where there's a huge number of species of sharks. Yes, you know, a great white shark in the wrong place at the wrong time may confuse you for a seal, but it's very rare. Often you'll have sharks coming up and being quite curious. Um, they may even be slightly aggressive if you get into their territory. Um, but they're not this sort of, you know, bogey sort of animal um, of our imagination. They are an, another animal and to be in the water with them and respect them is an amazing thing. Okay, from Chicago, great to have you with us. Um, we have, um, what is the temperature in Curacao? bananas in our class are freezing. Um, it, it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit um, here in Chicago. My Fahrenheit to Celsius isn't brilliant, uh, but I'll try and work it out. Uh, so we are about, how are we? We're 29 degrees Celsius, but it feels a lot hotter than that. Um, it's 85 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but it's um, what, half past one, in the afternoon in full tropical sunlight so you can sort of see this general uh, sunny face and melty maybe my, my face is looking like the melted banana right now um, you don't have to make any comments on that uh, Tanya asked are there any soft corals yeah certainly the soft corals um, 
beautifully beautiful beautiful soft corals uh, I'm, I'm not always get a lot of soft corals sort of further down um, and quite the dominant coral sort of really from sort of 50 meters down to 200 with corals uh, but I think when you used to really think about the um, the reef it's a hard coral making the structure and it's a 3d structure using the calcium carbonate the limestone that supports so many other animals Um, Alex would like to know, does fishing have an impact on corals? Alex, there's a very interesting report um, published um, about five years ago that linked really, really strongly the parrotfish fishing and coral health. So parrotfish play a very important role on the reef. They nibble away algae they're sort of the garden of the herbivores of the reef, the vegetarians. And by doing that, they create more space for corals to grow. Now, remember the biscuit here? Imagine that with sort of like slimy um, algae all over it, and that would be really hard to put a coral polyp on, a banana on, just slip off. And that's the same for a coral polyp. So if the parafish comes away and cleans all that off, it's really important. So the overfishing of the parafish had a negative impact on coral health. But in lots of great areas, there'd be some fantastic projects setting up no fishing areas, so marine protected areas. And that has brought back the parrotfish. And from that, corals have recovered. So, um, we have um, from Flatwoods Elementary, we have another question. What is coral made out of? You may have answered this, but the sound isn't good on our end. Well, I'm very sorry that the, the muffled sound where you are. Um, so, you'll probably remember a number of things. It is animal, vegetable, and mineral. So, we have the living tissue, animal, and that's the banana. We have inside that tissue, we have vegetable like algae, the soup sand belly, and then it takes calcium carbonate from the water and makes a structure. Calcium carbonate, you know, similar structure to our, our skeletons, and so it's really just a skeleton, but it's on the outside. Um, so the what we have here, growing this, and then around the outside, we have the coral tissue, quite thin, but this is really the skeleton. So it's an animal made out of tissue, but it grows a structure out of calcium carbonate and it has uh, algae inside it. So I hope that answers it. Let me know if that audio has come through okay your end. We're going to uh, Cartagena in Colombia and we have from Santiago, why are corals different colors? Um, great question, um, Santiago. We touched on this a little bit before with our M&Ms, and they get the coral animal is, is is clear, but like sort of a lot of jellyfish, and it gets its colour from the algae that live inside the tissue. So depending on the colour of the algae, that can basically gives the coral polyp its colour. So you've got the browns, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, and the greens. You may find some other colours, and you can get colours as blues and lilacs, so a light purple, and that will often be from some blocking protein of corals that live quite near the surface. Uh, Maria would like to know, is working on the reef dangerous? It really doesn't have to be. If you look after yourself, and you check your gear, and you dive safely, and you dive with a buddy and you're well trained and you do all the checks it really doesn't have to be dangerous at all you are in the natural environment so you do have to be careful so you have to think about when to say no you have to think about when it's too dangerous to go out if there's a storm and what to do if certain things happen there's a lot of planning probably much more planning 
and thought about health and safety than we would do on our everyday lives when we don't really do a well what happens if there's a really fast car when I come to this roundabout or this road or whatever it might be and what happens if this person turns up or what happens if I get a rogue puma uh, comes into our school or whatever it might be we do a lot more planning when we're working on expedition and working on field science um, Gustavo would like to know why do corals only grow in certain places now Gustavo that's an absolutely fantastic question um, what we have is a, we have a wider range of corals so we have cold water and deep water corals and those grow in a, in a wider range of places along the coast of Florida and Carolina up to um, we've got to Lophelia um, corals growing off the coast of Scotland now what we're thinking we've got a big start here for science dives going out so that's all the noise happening behind us people doing their checks going back to the danger point that somebody was asking about just earlier um, but to come back on to why they only grow in certain places the tropical shallow reef corals that we typically think of as, as, as a coral reef have quite a small band of tolerance so they like a few things they like clear water and the clear water is important so the light can come through it and help the photosynthesis of the algae and that's where the coral animal gets its, a lot of its sugars from up to 90 percent of its energy they like warm water so between about 23 and 29 degrees celsius and someone will work that out in fahrenheit uh, on the live chat i hope because i can't work it out in my head at the moment um, and lastly, like quite shallow water, so nice shallow water, really sort of zero down to 25, 30, maybe even 40 meters is where you get most of these reef grown corals. So that's why you only find them in this band. If you look at a distribution map of hard tropical corals, you'll see them in this band around the tropics, maybe not necessarily near river mouths because that may be putting a lot of uh, cloudy sediment into the water and potentially blocking sunlight from reaching the coral and allowing it to get energy from the algae inside it. So we've got time for just a couple more questions, if I can see these here. Um, from Chicago we have, um, what other careers can you have around corals apart from scientists? Well we have uh, Ellie uh, who's a science communicator so she did a, a science degree and then a master's in science communication with a specialism in uh, film and audio narrative so that's really important there's a lot of administration here you can work on the education side such as myself and also with most field research um, there are a number of technical jobs so that's either here using the boats to get the boats working or the um, diving side of it so really getting into the diving side of it and that's another side that you can think about as a career if you're interested in working on the coral reef and around coral science but without being a scientist and we our last question here we have alex loves the ocean alex you're fab uh, and he wants to work underwater what advice would you give to him well alex i do the, you can do so many things and it's great you have a passion because passion is the most important thing it's a very competitive field so it's not always going to be easy but with passion and perseverance you'll get through and the advice really is to start learning these skills and I'm not quite sure how old you are Alex but I think that understanding the natural world through learning geography and science is great understanding um, and getting better with your field skills so that could be volunteering even if you're not near the ocean volunteering um, with aquatic uh, conservation charities if you're if you're uh, in Chicago uh, looking at the lakes and some of the work that can be done there and showing that passion and getting the experience and then afterwards you can start to move into uh, more ocean related topics um, and whether that's science, whether that's um, working with ships uh, or whether that's diving or even being a submarine pilot. Do have a look at our submarine um, resources.
Alex is 11. Just, just Alex, stay passionate. Um, volunteer in nature. Uh, and you're, Alex is in Chicago. Um, try and see with your uh, family whether you can go out um, and do some volunteering on the Great Lakes. And that's, you know, just get experience that way. Um, spend time in nature, grow to love it, learn to understand it. Alex, really great talking to you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for as part of this session. Do tune in in about 45 minutes um, when we have a wonderful interview uh, with Dr. Valerie Chamberlain, finding out a little bit more about the science of the coral polyp and coral recovery. And then join us tomorrow where we've got, uh, we've got uh, for our live investigation, we have um, coral food chain mobiles and we have a wonderful wet lab tour uh, from uh, Dr. Mark Vermey and we have a Sponge Boy special um, at 10 o'clock with Jasper and Ben so that's something not to be missed uh, until the next session or until tomorrow thank you so much for being part of AXA Coral Live it's goodbye from Kamabi and goodbye from Ellie and myself bye bye